The hope of the Lord be with each of you also here in the studio, with each of the people in the production who are behind the cameras. The Lord wants to do great things and great wonders in the lives of His children, and today is no exception. My name is Pastor Jose Del Valle to bring you one hour of worship on today's topic together. For that, we are going to go today to study the book of Genesis in chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. And we're also going to see part of the apocalypse. Today, we promise it will be a direct message from heaven. So call your friends and family because time for worship has begun. Let's all now be unanimous in prayer. Let us raise this prayer to the throne of grace. All together, the Lord will listen to us. Oh, Father, creator of heaven and earth, thank you because we know that you are in this place, but you also move through your Holy Spirit to different parts of the world. Oh, Lord, we ask that you may be in this message and that we may contemplate you through it. We ask you, oh, God, that you can save us very soon and that together we can strengthen ourselves as a body nourished by you, and we can reach the heavenly homeland calling each other, supporting each other for good works, doing your will. Oh God, we ask you today that you can bless this program from its beginning to its end, and also that you can move lives so that they can accept you as their only personal Savior. Thank you for this opportunity you give us to communicate with you and also with our listeners. We ask you, Lord, for the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of your beloved Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, friends, today's topic united. Very important in this life. Today, when the news talks about wars and talks about a lot of uncertainty and there are rumors of war, we think of divided countries. We think of people who come together in different thoughts to wage war, but one group against another group for different interests. Human beings have this peculiarity of believing that size is a symbol of power. Look, a man says. I don't want a small dog. I want a big dog. I want a Rottweiler. I want a heavy one, so you see. Because I don't like the little one. Then the woman also comes and says, I want a tall, strong man like this because I don't like short ones. We always want a bigger house. We want a huge television. We want to look for a latest model cell phone that doesn't fit in our pockets. And that notice, my friend, that is not new. Did you know that the tallest building in the world is the Burj Khalifa? Located in Dubai, it has 163 floors and 828. By total work of engineering, 2,000 dine from any part of the city and miles around, you can see how the building stands out above the rest of the other constructions there. So that sounds impressive, but it's not even close to the tallest building humanity has ever built. Look, because when we talk about wonders in construction, we think, look, of great bridges or even pyramids. But the Bible tells us that the tallest building that has ever been built, a feat of ancient engineering that today cannot be compared with modern engineering. With all the technology that exists today, it cannot be matched. And we are talking about nothing more and nothing less than the Tower of Babel. It was built on a plain in the land of Shinar, as explained in the book of Genesis. It was also built after the flood. I am getting closer to the book of Genesis chapter 11 where this story of the Tower of Babel is. And this story was after the flood passed over the earth. This tower is then built with that attempt to show greatness 
to also show power And although it is a story that many of us know, we are going to do a deep analysis, a more detailed exploration of the biblical story. This biblical story is not only interesting because of that big and enormous tower, but because of all the consequences of intervention. Divine that has happened, like the confusion, for example, of languages and the emergence of different types of languages. And we can also talk about the legend of the confusion of languages because it has an etymological origin. The biblical narrator who writes, possibly at the time of the Israelites' captivity in Babylon, interprets the word Babel to mean confusion. Through this topic, we are going to realize that Babel is indeed three confusion and that there are three incorrect steps that men committed when they started a project without God's blessing. A meeting place, we're going to check that place out. We're going to go to our Bibles and we're going to read what it tells us about the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Firstly, it tells us there that at that time, a single language was spoken throughout the earth. Migrating to the east, the people found a plain in the region of Shinar and settled there. One day they said to each other, let's make bricks, sew them together by fire. And that's how they use bricks instead of stones and asphalt instead of mix. Here we find something very curious in the story. And in this biblical story, we can ask ourselves what the name of that meeting place was. And verse 2 speaks specifically of a region called Shinar. But why then is the tower not called the Tower of Shinar? And the answer is simple. The Bible itself will answer us in Genesis chapter 11 verse 9. You say in Genesis chapter 11 verse 9. That is why the city was called Babel because it was there that the Lord confused the language of all the people of the earth and from where he scattered them throughout the world. Did the city come to be called Babel after the intervention of God, which according to Genesis chapter 11, there verse 9, since this name means confusion precisely or mixture, since and we are going to talk a little about the word and verb, right? In Greek from balal, which is to confuse or mix, therefore. In the Hebrew language, Babel sounds like the verb that means to confuse okay. When we go to the Adventist biblical commentary, one of our official sources that we use explains that the name of their city, Babylu or Bellini, meant gate of God, gate of the gods. Others suggested that it owed its origin to a derivation of the verb to... Scatter to disperse, but the citizens would not have been very proud of that. And from there, the composition Babu or Dor plus Ilu, God now arises. So what that became was a play on words in Hebrew with the term Babel or Babylon, which, well, the Babylonians explain it as the portal of the gods, Babylon. Well, of course, the Babylonians did not want the capital of their empire to be... It was known as confusion. That's why the ancient Babylonian texts interpret Babalu or Babylianu.
Babylonu with the meaning of door of God or gift of the gods. And then when we speak like this, it sounds more beautiful than confusion. However, it is possible that this meaning was a secondary one and that the name originally came from the Babylonian verb yusen babalu, meaning to scatter or disappear. The story of Babel is famous because what God does is confuse the language and as a result it is not completed. Neither the city nor the tower can be completed. So it represents man's failure to then try to reach God and reach heaven on his own. Means because only the we are confused and dispersed. When I think about the Tower of Babel, notice that the first question that comes to mind is, why build that tower? I mean, I don't think it was to sell apartments there, right? Because today, there is a business with luxury apartments, and true, it could be, but I don't think it was for that, or because they would love to have an office there on the 1,200th floor, it would be terrible, So, they are climbing so many stairs. What do you believe, friend? A purchase that you are going to carry up the stairs up there was not due to lack of space either. When we build first floor usually, right, is it because we don't have more land and then the second or third floor is mounted on top of the roof, right? But let us remember that the Tower of Babel Yusan was a few generations after the flood occurred in the universe that is here on the entire planet Earth. It was the Great Flood, so there weren't that many people on the planet. So there was land to build on everywhere. Only Noah and his descendants remained. Now, when God makes that decision to cleanse the world of so much sin then there we go next to this story because we can see how quickly, how quickly men forget the most serious judgments and return to committing crimes again. That they had already committed before. Although the devastation of the flood was before their eyes, although they arose from the seed of righteous Noah, even during their lifetime, evil increased excessively. And nothing but the sanctifying grace of the Holy Spirit can remove sinful lust from the human will and depravity from the heart of man. Matthew Henry's commentary says that God's purpose was for humanity to form many nations and populate the entire earth. Despising the divine will and contrary to Noah's advice, the bulk of humanity united to build a city, a tower that would prevent them from being separated. Idolatry began and Babel became one of its main seats. They made each other more roasted and determined. Let us learn to encourage each other to love and good works. Just as sinners incite and encourage each other to bad works, also Sister Elena Hedaway says in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, the Builders. From the Tower of Babel, they had manifested a spirit of murmuring against God. Instead of remembering with gratitude his mercy toward Adam and his kind covenant with Noah, he had complained of his severity in driving the first Yusan couple out of Eden and in destroying the world by a flood.
he says, patriarchs and prophets, we are going to see a construction not approved by God. And let us ask ourselves what they were seeking to achieve. These people building such a tower, the Bible gives us the answer there. Same in Genesis chapter 11. Now let's get to verses 4 through. Verse 6, when the word of God says there, then they said, let's build a city with a tower that reaches to heaven. In this way, we will become famous and avoid being dispersed throughout the earth. But the Lord came down to observe the city and the tower that the men were building. And it was said that they all form one people and speak one language. This is just the beginning of their works and they will be able to achieve everything they set their minds to. When idolatry, when polytheism broke, that internal spiritual link, they not only lost the unity of religion, but also the spirit of brotherhood. A project like this, a project like that tower, which sought to preserve through an external means the internal unity that had been lost, was definitely doomed to failure. And it is obvious that only those who had renounced God took part in these activities. Man can oppose and oppose in an organized manner even against God. And it may seem that in a moment man is going to achieve his plans. But God intervenes at the precise moment when he has finished, when man has had enough time there making the plan. complete then God looks for the right place the right moment to see the change in man and do something so that the transgressive man can repent thanks to his mercy patience runs out at a certain point so God says not until here now it's my turn to intervene this is the time for me to act We will never be able to circumvent God's plans. Look, no matter how skillfully, no matter how much organization you say and proposed, the plans of those builders of... That Tower of Babel, you know they ended in shame. They were defeated. That whole plan ended in defeat. The monument of his pride served to commemorate his madness. But people today follow him, same path. They follow the same path, trusting in themselves and rejecting the law of God. And that is the same principle that Satan himself tried to practice in heaven. The same principle that Cain followed when presenting his offering Every human being must stop trusting in God before men because the Lord is wise and as a father who loves us, he wants the best for each of us. So let's not be like those who were building that tower who were against God's plan, believing that their own plans... could surpass his infinite wisdom. Unfortunately, that continues to happen to us. We know that we want or seek something that is not in accordance with the divine plan, with the designs of God, but even so, we continue to ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit that speaks in our ears to please our own desires. Let's remember that God's plans are good. Elena G. Dwight comments on it. Book History of the Patriarchs and Prophets. After the dispersion of Babel, idolatry came to be again. Yeah. 
almost universal, and the Lord finally let his hardened transgressors follow their evil ways. While choosing Abraham from the lineage of Shem to make him the repository of his law for future generations, the man joined together to Build the tower, why? The bad thing is that this place unfortunately did not have God's blessing because they were not doing what pleases God. And that is why today we must ask if our plans we are drawing up, writing down, are they God's plans or are they human plans? Because man has always sought that self-exaltation to take pride, to feed the ego. Not because I have such a doctorate. I have a capacity in this, a talent in this, right? So that attitude coincides perfectly with that attitude of Satan and at the same time contrasts sharply with the character of God who noticed that despite being God, he humbled himself. Jesus Christ came from heaven to save us. And that is why humility is so essential in the lives of you and I as Christians. Jesus said that he who humbles himself will be exalted and he who exalts himself will be humbled. Let's now see a tower that dishonors God. The story of Babel continues in the following way here in Genesis in chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. It would be better for us to go down and confuse their language so that they no longer understand each other. And in this way, the Lord dispersed them from there throughout the land and therefore they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because it was there where the Lord confused the language of all the people of the earth and from where he dispersed them throughout the world. Their hearts were full, but they were full of pride before God. They didn't want anything from him. They wanted to exhibit their own power, their own fame, thus placing themselves above God. Imagine yourself above the glory of God. That is why the Tower of Babel was intended to become a clear monument to wisdom superior to the abilities of its builders. Men have been willing to endure hardships, dangers. Deprivations in order to become good. Name or have a good reputation. But when we... We put on that attitude, we are making our ego go above the character of God. When we glory in any little thing we achieve, confusion is most likely to follow. Now, remember that in a church. I remember, right, in a church, a brother said that he wanted to work only for God, that he wanted a position in the church, which... He wanted to put his hands at the service of the church to be a useful servant, and I told the brother that a position was not appropriate.
His work depended on a faithful servant of the disposition of his heart, but that did not calm him much. A few months later, while reading the new positions, the brother was given an interesting position, and according to the skills and talents that he had demonstrated in the church, he was given the position But did you approach the nominating committee? And he rejected the position simply because it was not the position he wanted for a second position. Well, now he wants a third position. And for him, it was very small, right? I wanted to direct. I wanted to be seen, to be on the platform. I wanted to go up, right? And this brother was not looking to work for God. What he was looking for was not to serve the Lord. What he was looking for, it was personal recognition. What he, he sought his own fame. He sought to satisfy his desire for power. Making the same mistake. That those precisely who built the tower, trying to demonstrate greatness and only then. What they were really demonstrating was their arrogance. Zweitausendein. So God's purpose was for man to spread over the entire face of the earth and not just stay in one place, but to multiply and fill the earth. And that is God's purpose precisely with humanity at that moment. That was what Adam and Eve indicated in the Garden of Eden. When we go there to Genesis, also to Noah, to their children, to their wives when they left the ark. And God establishes his pact with Noah and some regions could be devastated. And also men and animals swept away by the hundreds of millions. but there would never again be a universal destruction of the earth by a flood. That's why the rainbow comes out. That covenant contained nothing but a stipulation and took the form of a divine promise. However, this promise does not imply that God is obliged not to destroy the world again by means other than water. Still, men did not believe in God. They turned their backs on God, but they feared that another catastrophe like that universal flood would be repeated. Zweitausendine, and that regardless of all the power, the money, they would be devastated again. So they built that enormous tower also thinking that if they managed to surpass the clouds, they could climb with all their treasures to the highest floors of the tower. And so they escape from the wrath of God that no matter the way, the tide, even the tide due to those incessant rains, they were never going to have problems because in their great arrogance, they believed that their tower could defeat God. Come on. What the man in the Tower of Babel is doing is blatantly challenging God with an attitude that is totally contrary to what God had ordered. And many people today live their lives with attitudes contrary to what God commands in His Word. But the truth is that man reaps what he sows. The greatest mistake of human beings is precisely opposing God's plans. He has great good plans for man. It seems to us then that man has a better solution, but no, God is the one who has the solution to life's problems. God offers a solution. God offers an answer. Now get ready, because now now shortly we are going to go deeper into this topic and we are going to see much more of the representation in Revelation regarding the city of Babel as such.
And now recapitulating, right? Recapitulating that he was born with the first inhabitants of Mesopotamia and therefore at the beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod and as a probable seat of his power as we have in Genesis chapter 10, verse 10 with respect to that location, that identification, the opinions where the tower was from since they are divided. But when are we going to talk, right, about what Babel and Babylon are as we were explaining, right? Because some scholars say that Babel and Babylon are two different cities and others say that they are a truth. And others, what they say is that Babylon was built on top of where were the remains of the tower. So where the city of Babel was there, well, then Babylon was built. So in my case, I support the last two positions. And then when we go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, there we do see that it mentions, right, the city of Babel as Babel. And also in verse 9 of chapter 11, Babel is also mentioned. But in the other use and Babylon is mentioned in everything. So that tower and the Bible are mentioned. Well, truth be told, they're... is nothing left, but the idea of erecting structures of that nature was popular in the first primitive Mesopotamia, and practically every important city had at least one of these towers, and they were called Sigurat. That's But they were called Ziggurat. These towers were generally built on step platforms, right? One after the other, each time smaller, the big one below and smaller and smaller. And at the top, top up, there was an altar dedicated to the main god of that city or country. So the ruins of some of those ziggurats are still standing today. We can see some of them, right, when traveling. These countries are preserved, right? For example, that of Ur in the south of Iraq and also near Iran. The remains of the ziggurat are still impressive. However, the tallest and largest structure in Mesopotamian history was the Babylonian Temple Terrace Tower. As I mentioned, for many, it would be the primitive tower of Babel or another built on the foundations of that original, but it almost, almost completely disappeared. So we know that because of its square base, which consisted of seven step platforms. It was also one above the other, right? Up and up was the altar dedicated to the god Marduk. The Tower of Babel was therefore repaired from time to time, and the last time recorded was by Nebuchadnezzar, who said he had received the order from his god Marduk to rebuild it again so that that top could rival the sky. This temple tower was called Etemenanki, right? That means the fundamental stone or foundation house of heaven and earth. Then it was destroyed by Xerxes, but then Alexander the Great made plans to rebuild it again. But unfortunately, well, not unfortunate in our case, because death surprised him when that work was being done then. Nothing remained of that building. When we make the parallel between Babel or Babylon with the biblical prophecy of our times, we can clearly notice the apocalyptic symbolic characteristics. 
That is why since 1844, when they began to preach the three united messages that precisely represent the final message of God, but divided into three first, the beginning of the judgment, 1844. You remember the great disappointment. The good news began to be preached. Human race was restored, was redeemed. The blood of Jesus is enough to cleanse the sin of anyone who accepts him as their savior. They make us free because he has already paid and declares us righteous. The gospel has to do with justification by faith, which is a work of God, not only with the forgiveness of sins, and it is also grace. Abundant. The second message joins the first and is when the church suffers confusion, adopting practices, adopting pagan doctrines. And then the third angel, the message joins the first two previous messages and leads us to highlight the Sabbath because the U.S. is going to make a use and decree and agreement with the apostate churches. And then that final punishment will Come after the 1,000 years. Then after the message of the third angel, God shows that he preserves a faithful remnant, a people united in the end, which is the one who keeps the commandments of God and who begins to preach it, those people of God who preach the message. So Babylon, unfortunately, has been becoming even more corrupted since that preaching began, even more so because of those false doctrines. His cup is full of pagan teachings and bad practices. The kings of the earth are presidents, governors of the whole world who have supported Babylon. Then the false ministers with the syringes that today they call tongues or angelic tongues or good tongues tell them differently or the doctrine of hell. For example, they make them afraid that they are going to be burning for an entire eternity. It is secret rapture. All that is confusion. God calls to leave Babylon to get out of the confusion because the plagues will soon fall on her. These plagues are destined for Babylon without mercy because patience runs out. Now, the message of the three angels, reinforced with the message of the other angel, the sincere will be able to hear the voice of God. Thanks to that, those messages come together, and thanks to the fact that God is calling, get out of there. By calling the children of God, many will be able to break the chain of error. We see in Revelation 14, verse 8, That is the first mention of this city and it is the main target of God's judgments in chapter 16 to 18 when he speaks of proud Babylon, a condemnation of the world's opposition to God. The Babylon of the Old Testament represented the oppressor of God's people and the confusion Now in Apocalypse, it is a figure or symbol of opposition to God in the time of the end. That is why Revelation 16, the first four bowls use literal language while the last three have figurative symbolic implications in a figurative way, clearly explained. And let's go then, use, and I invite you to go to verse 12 of Revelation 16. There, the verse that tells us the text of Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and the water of this, it was dried up, so that the way would be prepared for the... Kings of the East. 
In this text, some interpret when the Euphrates River is mentioned as if it were a specific region where the river is literally there. But we must remember that this is the river precisely of Babylon. The Euphrates River was part of the defensive system of Babylon and that this name in the apocalyptic prophecy is symbolic, already representing the Harlot of chapter 17 with her daughters, which we can mention with great respect, right, to our brothers, because I also have family from this town, and I also have friends, very friends. Uh. They are also within a system and have treated me very well, but we have to carry with the freedom that we have today, day of preaching the message, the truth. So are the Roman Catholicism and the Protestant churches. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 35 to 38. I would also like to read it. Why a sword against the Chaldeans, says the Lord, and against the inhabitants of Babylon, against their princes and against their wise men, a sword against the soothsayers, and they will be made dumb, a sword against their mighty men, and they will be broken with sword against their horses, against their chariots, and against all the people who are in the midst of it, and they will be like women's swords against their treasures, and they will be plundered. Plunder upon its waters, and they will dry up because it is a land of idols, and they are made foolish by images. But in Revelation 16 and 12, it represents the political powers of the world. When we go to Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, we can also read there and we can go to verse 15 as well. Revelation 17a and Revelation chapter 17 verse 15 says, Thus the word of God then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls and spoke with me saying, Come hither and I will show you the sentence against the great harlot, the one who sits over many waters. He also told me the waters that you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The next detail we notice in Revelation 16 and 12 is that the river dries up. God dried up in history. Notice that this river had already dried up. Well, they had dried it up, rather. And you can see it yourself in Isaiah chapter 44, in verses 24 to 28. You can study it, study that story, so that it can draw out. Then more messages in your personal study. The kings of Media and Persia, remember they came together to dry up this river. The Medes and the Persians at the time of Cyrus and Darius, they deviate that riverbed, making that then it dried up and through the dry bed in the wall of Babylon. The invading armies were able to enter and achieve the fall of Babylon. Remember that Babylon was so strong and so large that it was difficult for other peoples to enter. So they used the river for that. In the year 538 B.C., the river, well, history will repeat itself. The river is water and the waters represent nations. These nations are those who have supported the harlot. Now, when the nations realize it of that work that is being carried out by the Roman church, Well, also by the other churches that follow them. Way they're going to refuse that one to support them. So this is going to open. This is what opens the way for that. 
Again, the kings of the east come in, help of the persecuted people. Yai. In Revelation, the loss of political support from Babylon is indicated. Revelation chapter 17, verse 16, precisely speaks there. And the ten horns that you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and will leave her desolate and naked and will devour her flesh and will burn her with fire. The kings of the east liberated the people of God from Babylon, the historical Babylon I am talking about. And you can then read Isaiah chapter 41, verses from chapter 41, from verse 1 to 3, and also verse 25. You can read, and there you will be able to understand more. It is a figure of your liberation that is it is a figure of your final liberation through the second coming of Christ. History is going to repeat itself. Yes, it is going to repeat itself, but in a figurative, symbolic way. A new Babylon is presented as doing the same work as that cruel empire of the Euphrates. One was literal Babylon and another is spiritual Babylon. The righteous who experience that persecution then see that God is just because these kings are Jesus and the angels who come to rescue God's people. Already, so that's why we can go here to the Bible and we can see a lot of very good things. For example, we can also see the new Jerusalem when it is going to descend from heaven and arrive here. And we can make a comparison of what the new Jerusalem and Babylon are. And there are texts that can indicate that. For example, Babylon versus the new Jerusalem. Babylon is a harlot, but if we look at the new Jerusalem, she is a bride. Notice you can see it in chapter 17, verse 1, and also in 21, 9. Chapter 21, verse 9 in Revelation also sees that she has committed fornication with the kings of the earth, but versus the... New Jerusalem, the kings of the earth bring glory. They bring honor to her. Then we can see that God is promising us something good a new city, a city totally different from what we have seen in this Babylon. The inhabitants of the earth have become drunk with. His teaching, 17 verse 2. And when we go to 21 verse 24, the parallel, the nations of the earth will walk in the light of it. Babylon is clothed in purple and scarlet. She is adorned with gold, with products of her filth, in verse 4. But when we go to chapter 21, verse 11, we see that the new Jerusalem has the glory of God. It has its brilliance, and it is like a precious stone when we go to Babylon. And we see there that bitterness that it had. It says that it has a cup of gold in your hand full of abominations. And the new Jerusalem offers water of life resplendent as crystal. You in verse 27. We can also see in verse 8, speaking of Babylon, that its inhabitants are not written in the book of life. And when the parallel chapter goes, chapter 21, verse 6 or verse 27, I must say its inhabitants are written in the book of life. Look how pretty, right? What the Lord promises us. And I want you to go to heaven too. That's why I speak to you clearly through this channel. God will give Babylon while the new Jerusalem to drink of the wine of his wrath in Revelation 16, 19. See, see the promise in verse 6 of chapter 21, God will give the water of life freely to the thirsty.
There is life for everyone while that Babylon, the light of her lamp, will no longer light, says verse 23 of chapter 18. And when we then go to the New Jerusalem, we see that contrast that the Lord will illuminate in chapter 22, verse 5. And we can also see that Babylon will be burned with fire and destroyed in chapter 18, verses 8 and verse 21. And we can also see that the New Jerusalem, in contrast to Babylon, then their God will reign with her forever, according to verse 5 of chapter 22. Friend, today's call is in the world that today professes to be Christian. Many move away from the clear teachings of Holy Scripture and build a creed based on human speculations. In fables, pleasant fables, perhaps nothing more to the ear, but it is not the truth. They point to their tower as a way to ascend to heaven, forgetting the divine plan and completely turning their back on God, on God's commandments, on the loving instruction that the Lord has left us. Many are in that valley of Babylon, in that valley of confusion. We must be careful because perhaps we are in confusion Blinded by our own arrogance, moving further and further away from God. People seek their own desires. They are filled with pride, vain glory, life, ego, and those desires for recognition and glory and all that. Today's invitation is to use unity, but to worship the true God. Worship Him, but with those actions of well-being. May our lives be cemented with God every day. May we remain firm in the ways of the Lord, consecrating ourselves more and more. Let's build, let's build ourselves. Let us build on the foundation that is Christ Jesus, the eternal rock, and let the voice of the Holy Spirit guide our steps now and always. Today is the time to say no Hababel, no to Satan, say yes to Jesus. How many of those who are listening to this message today accept this invitation of love from our Creator who has told us through this record? He has given us the opportunity to see the history of what has happened. We are living in the present and it also allows us to see the future through this sacred record and we can know what is coming. God promises you a new Jerusalem. Leave Babylon behind. Leave Babel behind. And today build a tower. But for God, may it please the Lord. I want to invite you to have a final prayer so that we can consecrate ourselves just as I have made this call. I hope that one day not too distant you can be with all of us from here in production there in Yusand. The heavenly Canaan, because there, there will be no more war. There will be no more suffering and there will be no more confusion because the truth is Jesus and we are going to live with him for an eternity. Let us pray, brothers, how good, Lord God Almighty, to be able to recognize that you are God over all things, that you are great, that you have been manifested in the history of humanity throughout this world. We recognize, Lord, that you are no longer going to cause the earth to be removed or destroyed by water, but fire is coming that consumes sin. Sinners forever and once and for all purifies this earth.
oh Lord, I want to be part of the new Jerusalem, not Babylon. And so our friends who are tuning into us who have accepted this call can also, Lord, in the not too distant future, because you promise to return very soon, enter the heavenly Canaan, enter that city there, or be in the surrounding area. The important thing is to arrive, Lord. It does not matter which door of the city I'm going to enter. The important thing is that I am going to be there together with you, God. Have mercy on us and bless, Lord, each person and this channel. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of the eternal Savior be with you all. May the Lord be able to give you much peace, many blessings from above, and may today not be just another day. May today be a day that you can feel filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. guiding him towards the truth, leaving error behind and reaching Mount Zion. And on his garment and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He is the Word of God. He is the one who takes away the sin of the world and wants to cleanse you from all evil. The Lord wants to open his doors and wants to deposit his salvation in you. God be with you. Peace of God.